All right, the minor prophets for beginners, majoring in minors, lesson number five. And today we're going to look at uh, Obadiah and Micah, the two minor prophets. In this lesson, uh, we're going to examine the lives and the prophecies of, as I mentioned, Obadiah, who is the fourth prophet in the series of the minor prophets, and Micah, who is the sixth prophet on the list that, uh, that is given in the Hebrew uh, Bible. I've chosen to study them in this way because the fifth minor prophet mentioned is Jonah and his life and his work was very different than Obadiah and Micah. Those two are similar, Jonah is uh, different. Now, although these lived at the same time, Obadiah and Micah's books contain a prophetic message to or about God's people. Even though Jonah was considered a prophet, his warnings were not uh, directed at the Northern Kingdom or the Southern Kingdom, uh, but rather to the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, the city of Nineveh. So he's kind of special, he's kind of different, and we're, gonna, we're going to do him next time. So we're going to do the fourth and the sixth minor prophets today, Obadiah and Micah and then uh, a two-part lesson uh, on the fifth minor prophet, Jonah, and we'll start that next week. Okay, uh, Obadiah, the prophet. Uh, the name Obadiah means a servant of Yahweh or worshiper of Yahweh. There were several other Obadiahs that are mentioned in the, uh, in the Old Testament. For example, there was Obadiah who was the steward of King Ahab. King Ahab who ruled the Northern Kingdom with his wicked wife, Queen Jezebel. This Obadiah was the steward of the king's house and he was a devout man who hid and protected hundreds of prophets from Jezebel's uh, persecution. We read about that in 1 Kings chapter 18. So that's one other uh, Obadiah. And then there was also an Obadiah who is listed in the genealogies of uh, First Chronicles chapter three. And uh, he is a de descendant of Joab. You remember Joab, uh, that character? Uh, Joab uh, was the military leader who served uh, King David. And so one of his descendants was uh, Obadiah. Uh, there's not much information about uh, the background of the prophet Obadiah, other than the fact that he is grouped with prophets who lived in the eighth century BC, and that his prophecies targeted the nation of Edom and their mistreatment of the Southern Kingdom. So it is assumed that he lived in or around Jerusalem. We don't have any information about Obadiah's family. We don't know what trade uh, he practiced. Uh, we don't have any information about his calling by God into ministry. We only know about his time and of course the prophecies uh, that he made. Again, other than his placement along with other prophets who lived before the fall of the Northern Kingdom in 721 BC, Obadiah's book does not mention events that take place at the time that he lived. Some scholars put his time after the destruction of the Southern Kingdom in 586 BC. But as I've mentioned before, I've kept the order of the prophets that are listed in the Hebrew uh, Bible. As far as Obadiah's message is concerned, little map here to uh, help us uh, focus on the message itself. Obadiah's prophecies uh, are a judgment of God on the nation of Edom for their arrogance and violence and lack of compassion toward their brother nation of Judah, which was the Southern Kingdom. Uh, and especially when Judah, the Southern Kingdom, uh, when they were attacked and destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, some 200 years into the future. So his prophecies, Obadiah, are far into, the, far into the future concerning the Southern Kingdom. Now Obadiah uh, pronounces divine judgment, not on the Southern Kingdom, but rather on Edom, 
because instead of defending or helping their ancient fraternal nation of Judah, while Judah was besieged by the Babylonian army, uh, Edom did the opposite. They opposed, they mistreated, they even took advantage of the dire situation uh, that the Southern Kingdom is in. And the reason we've put this map there is to show you Edom. There's the, there's the uh, nation of Edom there to the Southeast. And then you had, of course, uh, Moab, which was uh, directly east of uh, the uh, Southern Kingdom. So Obadiah's prophecy was against Edom uh, and uh, its uh, eventual destruction. And so in Obadiah chapter one, uh, verse 11, we read the following, it says, on the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, his here is referring to Judah, is referring to the Southern Kingdom. Obadiah talks about the nation as it's one person, but he's referring to the nation. So he says, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. And so the Edomites, uh, they stood by when Jerusalem was attacked and they even participated in looting the city. And for this reason, Obadiah is, of course, God is pronouncing judgment on Edom for this, uh, for this crime. Uh, we also read about uh, Edom and what they did uh, from other uh, uh, prophets Jeremiah talks about uh, the situation in Lamentations 4. He says, rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Uz, but the cup will come around to you as well. Of course, the cup is always, right, in, in the Bible, it's either a cup of blessing, you know, like, like David would say, my cup uh, overflows. But in this case, when the cup comes around to you, usually that means the judgment is coming to you or your day will come, so he says, but the cup will come around to you as well. You will become drunk and make yourself naked. The punishment of your iniquity has been completed, O daughter of Zion. He will exile you no longer, but he will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will expose your sins. And so there Jeremiah is talking about the very same uh, uh, sin, the very same uh, problem that uh, Obadiah refers to, and even Ezekiel, talks about the same thing. I'll go to Ezekiel 35, five. He says, because you have had everlasting enmity and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at a time of their calamity, at the time of the punishment of the end. So even uh, Ezekiel uh, talks about uh, the Edomites and uh, they're accused of harboring hostility towards Judah, even during the time of calamity even during the time of their greatest need, uh, their ancient brothers that lived in Edom um, would not help them. So Obadiah's message therefore is that God will not forget uh, and he will not excuse Edom's cruel attitude and actions of exacerbating Judah's suffering in a time of crisis. Their own judgment and their suffering will also come uh, make no doubt about that. A little bit about the Edomites. Uh, I go back to the map. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. When they say your ancient brother, they're talking about way back, there was uh, the relationship. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, who settled in the region southeast of the Dead Sea known as Edom or Mount Seir. Same, same thing, Mount Seir, Edom, same reference. They had a, a sense of security about the natural protection that their territory afforded them. For example, the rugged mountain terrain uh, offered a, a natural defense against invaders. Uh, they built dwellings on the cliffs and in the caves that dotted their territory. And these made it difficult to attack and, and capture. And also they had very little fertile agricultural land, which offered little incentive 
for invaders to conquer. Invaders conquered you because you had something that they wanted. If you had fertile land and crops, if you had flocks of sheep and so on and so forth, they would come in and, 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 and take these over. Well, though the Edomites lived, they were cliff dwellers and so on and so forth. And so they didn't have a lot of natural uh, wealth. However, over time, Ob uh, Obadiah's prophecies of their judgment and elimination were realized uh, in a very unusual way. You know, in the, in the Bible, when you talk about, when the prophets talked about the Southern Kingdom or the Northern Kingdom, that their judgment would come, well, it came, you know, the Assyrians came uh, for Samaria and boom, they were wiped out, uh, you know, in a, in a battle, in a, in a, in a, in a raid. Uh, same thing with the Judah, the Babylonians came, you know, there was a siege, of course, it lasted for a long time, but eventually they, 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 they overran the city, they destroyed the city, they carried people off. You know, their end was traumatic and so to speak sudden, but it wasn't like that for Edom. Their judgment came, but it came over, over time. For example, uh, during the Hellenistic period after Alexander the Great uh, 323 to 31 BC, uh, an Arab group called the Nabataeans expanded into Edomite territory and they built the uh, prominent city of Petra, which is uh, modern day Jordan. And then the Roman Empire annexed the Nabataean kingdom, including former uh, Edomite territory in 106 AD and uh, the region of Edom uh, became a province of um, Arabia. And then the Arab conquest, with the rise of Islam in the seventh century AD, the Edomite region became a part of the Islamic Caliphate. Now we hear that word caliphate all the time, especially, you know, the ISIS, the caliphate, they're trying to set up a caliphate. What's a caliphate? Well, a caliphate uh, means successor someone who is the successor or the next in line to a king, that's the caliphate in the Muslim terms. And so the Islamic caliphate is the political and religious state comprising of the Muslim community and lands under its control uh, after the death of Muhammad in AD. Uh, 602, and they're always trying to, you know, gener after, uh, generation after generation, they're trying to establish an Islamic caliphate, meaning a territory that is controlled completely uh, uh, by, uh, by Islam, Islamic law, Islamic military, Islamic customs. And it doesn't matter if it's, they take over one country, they, ju they just take over a swath of territory that could, that starts in one country and, and, you know, and, 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 and leads into another country. Well, whatever they control, that's the Islamic caliphate. It was like that back in those days and it's like that even, uh, even today. And so uh, the, the destruction of the Edomites did not come in a single battle is what I'm trying to say. Over the years, their territory was chipped away at. Over, ter over the years, its territory was annexed by other peoples. Eventually, the distinct identity of the Edomites was eventually absorbed into the Arab uh, uh, population. In this way, Obadiah's prophecy uh, about Edom's eventual destruction was fulfilled but it was fulfilled over a long period of time. It didn't happen in a single event, but gradually over time. It lost its territory as well its distinct identity as it was absorbed into larger nations that uh, conquered it. Um, the, uh, the great distinction of the Jewish people uh, that I need to mention here is that they have retained their identity and their culture and their religion, as well as most of their territorial uh, land uh, to this day. I mean, when you talk about the Jews, you're talking about a nation, you're talking about a, a people and a culture that is 4,000 years old. If you go back to Abraham, Abraham was 2,000 years before Christ. So 2000 years before Christ, you know, roughly, 
you, you have Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and you go all the way to today, we're in 2024 AD. That, that's 4,000 years a people has existed. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and also that the Jewish people will endure perpetually is a key belief central to Jewish theology and identity. The Jewish people believe that God promised that they will, they will remain. So long as the earth is here, they will remain. And there are passages both in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, and then again in the New Testament, Romans chapter 11, one and two, and 25 to 29, that support this idea that the Jewish people will, uh, will remain. As long as the earth remains, they will remain. Of course, they believe that uh, today anyways, uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, some believe uh, and await a Messiah, you know, like 2000 years ago, they were waiting for a Messiah. Some of them believe that. But others in Judaism, Judaism believe that they themselves, in other words, the nation of Israel itself, it is the Messiah. It is through the nation of Israel that God will bring uh, you know, the final chapter in the, earth's, uh, in the earth's history and the earth's uh, story. We of, course, uh, we of course believe that the Messiah has come and uh, he, wa he was a Jew, Jesus Christ uh, or Jesus of Nazareth uh, and continues uh, to uh, exist uh, and direct his church um, today. However, it's interesting to note that this idea that the Jewish nation continues to exist today and to the end of time, not as the Messiah, but I believe as a witness, as God's witness, these people continue to be a witness of the truth of the scriptures. They continue to be a witness of what took place when Jesus came uh, and the establishment of the church. You know? I, I think it's one of the things that uh, leads uh, to a lot of the hatred of this people because it continues to witness to the existence of God. Even if they rejected the Messiah that was sent, they still, just by their presence, uh, witness uh, the fact that there is, um, there is a God and that God has um, intervened in human history in a very real way. Okay, we're a little off the track here, but I thought that was a fascinating thing when we were talking about the Edomites. Let's talk about uh, Obadiah's book, uh, shall we? His book uh, is the shortest book in the Hebrew Bible, consisting of only one chapter, only 21 verses. Here's a brief outline of the book, as you see in the uh, overhead here. The introduction, verses one to four. Uh, a salutation and identification of the, uh, of the prophet himself. Uh, the second part, judgment against Edom. Verses five to 14 takes up the large part of the book itself. As I told you, he was not preaching against the Southern Kingdom or the Northern Kingdom. He was speaking against uh, Edom. And so in these verses, you have the pronouncement of God's judgment against Edom for their pride and arrogance and violence, and also descriptions of the coming destruction and the futility of Edom's perceived strength. Doesn't matter that you live in cliff dwellings. It doesn't matter that you don't have a lot of agriculture and the mountains are protecting you. It doesn't matter. Your, your nation will fall. Your, you, you will be dissipated from, from history. And sure enough, it, uh, it took place. Um, uh, reasons for Edom's judgment, third part, two verses 15 and 16. Uh, is an explanation of the reasons behind uh, Edom's judgment, emphasizing their actions against their brother nation, Israel. They're being judged in the way that they treated Jerusalem when they needed help. And then there's the talk of the day of the Lord in uh, Obadiah, verses 17 to 21. The announcement of the day of the Lord when God will judge all nations. Uh, the promise of restoration for Israel and the establishment of God's kingdom. And of course, the final victory 
of the house of Jacob. All of these things are the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a single event. It is a reference to many different events that take place in the Old Testament and in the, uh, in the New Testament. And then finally, his conclusion, verse 21, the kingdom uh, belongs uh, to the Lord. And so the book of Obadiah primarily focuses on the judgment of the uh, country of Edom for their mistreatment of Israel. It emphasizes the consequences of pride and violence and lack of compassion. And the prophecy concludes with a message of hope for the restoration of Israel, not the restoration of the Edomites, the restoration of Israel, you know, despite what the Edomites have done to the Israelites, despite the fact that the Israelites you know, have been uh, damaged and so on and so forth, uh, uh, there's hope, uh, there's compassion, uh, a message of hope for the restoration of Israel and the establishment of God's kingdom. And so the themes of divine judgment and ultimate restoration, as I've mentioned to you before, uh, these are common elements found in many prophetic books. It's a, it's a cycle, you know, uh, there's a warning, there's a judgment, uh, you know, that's going to come. And then at the end, most prophets have a message of hope. If you repent, God will do this and bring days of restoration and days of, you know, new wine and, and so on and so forth. A couple of, even from a small book with 21 verses, there are lessons that apply to us or we can apply to our situation. First lesson, don't rejoice over your enemy's failure. Don't rejoice over your enemy's failure. Proverb 24, 17, it says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Why not? Well, first of all, we're all sinners. The judgment could be on us. Next time we'd be the ones being judged if we're too quick to be happy for the fall of our enemies. And also we're supposed to love and pray for our enemies, not laugh at their judgment. And we can be thankful that justice is meted out, but gloating is a fleshly, uh, uh, a fleshly action full of pride, it's not like Christ. Uh, a more Christ-like action is to feel sorrow for the judgment uh, of our enemies and to uh, uh, pray for them. Of course, it, it's counterintuitive. The natural impulse is like, well, at last, man, but that guy got what he was coming to him. Boy, am I ever happy about that? I mean, that's the natural inclination. Uh, but the but the scripture tells us we need to fight that natural inclination and uh, respond more in a Christ-like way. So anyways, one lesson, don't rejoice over your enemy's failure. Another lesson, we have a responsibility to help other people. Edom was judged and punished primarily for the fact that they refused to help their brethren when it was needed and when they had the chance to be helpful to them. The fact that they used Judah's hardship to take advantage only made it worse. And so there are any number of causes that randomly solicit our help every day. However, there are times when our family and our church or our neighbors need help and the credibility of our faith is tested and we are judged in moments like these. You know, uh, I have a feeling one of the questions that we may be asked at judgment is, what did you do when people needed you? Where were you when the church needed you? You know, I mean, we have to, we have to answer those questions uh, to ourselves, certainly. And then perhaps another lesson that comes from uh, uh, Obadiah, take advantage of every opportunity to make peace. The historical enmity between Israel and Edom led to both their downfalls, not just Edom, but Israel as well. Israel did not get help from Edom and they fell to the Babylonians. Edom was absorbed into the Arab nation because God did not preserve them. That was his judgment. So take advantage of opportunities to convert enemies to friends because you never have too many friends.
you always need, you know, one more friend. That's a good lesson from uh, Obadiah. Okay, so there's a, a little summary of uh, what the book of Obadiah is about. If you go back and read it again, uh, it may, you know, uh, be a little more meaningful to you. All right, let's take a look at uh, the other prophet, Micah. Micah, chapter one, verse uh, one, his name means uh, who is like Yahweh. He is identified as Micah of Moresheth, a town in southwestern Judah, which distinguishes him from another prophet called Micah in 1 Kings 22. That's the problem in the Old Testament. These, these names were common, so you have to kind of uh, you know, determine which, which, Micah is, uh, which Micah is this. Uh, this Micah here prophesied in the years between 735 and 700 BC, which means he was a witness to the destruction of the Northern Kingdom by Assyria in 721. Again, in verse one, he mentions the kings who re reigned during his lifetime. He says, uh, he, he, he names Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uh, all of these were rulers of the southern kingdom. He was a contemporary of Hosea the prophet who preached in the northern kingdom as well as Isaiah who preached in the southern kingdom. Verse one also describes uh, that his calling by God occurred during the reign of King Jotham and served during Ahaz and Hezekiah and that he would address both Samaria in the north as well as Jerusalem in the south with his messages from God. And so it's interesting, Obadiah is not talking about north or south, he's talking about Edom. Micah is uh, prophesying uh, against or towards the, the north and the south. Other than the time and the place of his ministry, Micah's book contains no other personal information about the prophet or his family or any details of his life. Uh, the only important thing that we draw is the message that God gave him uh, to speak. As far as his time, uh, Micah preached to both North and South during a time of political and military upheaval, as well as social corruption, idolatry, unfaithfulness. It was a bad time. It was a bad time in both the kingdom. So for example, in the Northern Kingdom, Samaria was under the threat of invasion by Assyria, which I said eventually took place in 721 during Micah's lifetime. So he had warned them, he had prophesied against them that something would happen. And in his own lifetime, the things that he talked about came to be. Uh, at, uh, at his time or during his time, there were political upheavals, there were assassinations, all kinds of instability among uh, the people. There was also widespread idolatry and social injustice. There was broad immorality as the nation drifted away from God's commands, not only for proper worship, but also moral conduct in business and personal relationships, lying, adultery, theft, murder. You know, the, the, the society was just coming apart, coming morally, spiritually, they were just falling apart in the Northern Kingdom. In the Southern Kingdom, Judah also faced the threat from Assyria. They were spared from defeat by God during the reign of Hezekiah. Uh, we know uh, when we read about Hezekiah, an angel came and decimated Sennacherib's army. 185,000 soldiers were killed in one night. We read about that in 2 Kings, also in Isaiah chapter 37. However, the Southern Kingdom continued mixing pagan worship with the worship of Jehovah. Uh, that phenomenon is called syncretism. You know, to sync up something, syncretism is when you sync up different religions, when you take elements of different religions and you, and you sync them together to form one religion. That's called syncretism. There was uh, also economic exploitation of the poor, leaders failed to uphold justice, uh, there was political corruption taking place in the nation. 
And so Micah was sent to both kingdoms. He was sent to the north to warn about the leader's disobedience to God and its consequences, to warn about corruption, as well as the need for repentance. And they needed to repent in a hurry because their judgment was coming very soon. He was sent to the south to preach about the importance of justice and mercy and humility. He also called for repentance and warned of the impending judgment of God. The fact that uh, the Assyrians almost overran the southern kingdom as well as the northern kingdom was a, a kind of a, a shot across the bow, if you wish, a warning uh, to the southern kingdom that look what happened to your, you know, your, 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 your brother, your brothers in the northern kingdom. Look what happened to them with this very same army that has almost destroyed you. Uh, so pay attention. Uh, his message, if you look at his preaching a little more uh, clearly, Micah condemned the northern kingdom for its social injustices, including oppression of the poor, bribery, corruption. Leaders and elites were criticized for exploiting the vulnerable. That, that's what was taking place, not just idolatry, uh, but it sprinkled down, uh, it trickled down into everyday uh, behavior. Uh, he preached and warned of divine judgment. He prophesied about the impending judgment of God on Israel due to their disobedience. The Assyrian threat was looming and Micah warned that it was a consequence of the people's unfaithfulness. He was connecting the dots. The, the king and the people thought, well, it's because our army is not big enough. It's because we haven't made you know, alliances with other nations to protect us against you know, the Assyrian threat. And Micah was going around saying, no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has, it has to do with your disobedience to God. That's the problem. Not that you don't have military alliances or your army is not big enough. Uh, God proved that to the Southern Kingdom by sending one single angel to wipe out the entire uh, Assyrian army. No, 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 no. The, the problem is your conduct. That's what needs to change. And of course, his overall call for repentance. Despite the message of judgment, Micah called the people to repentance and he urged them to turn away from their sinful practices and return to God and seek justice and righteousness. Read about that in Micah chapter six, verses six to eight. Uh, Repent and God will take care of the threat. That, that was the message, but they didn't. They didn't pay attention to him. And then he was called to speak to the, uh, the Southern Kingdom. And his message was similar, but there were particular things, especially uh, designed for the, for the South. Warning against injustice in Judah. Micah addressed similar issues, social injustice, corruption. He criticized leaders and judges and prophets for their role in perpetuating unethical behavior. Micah 3, 9 to 11. Also, the assurance of divine judgment. Just as the Northern Kingdom, Micah warned Judah about the consequences of their actions. The impending Babylonian exile was foretold as a divine judgment for their uh, disobedience. Uh, it was a different army, uh, you know, a different king, but it was the same scenario. The same thing that happened to the North is gonna to happen to you. It's just gonna be a different army that, uh, that overruns you. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, as in most uh, prophets, he mentions the hope of restoration. Amidst the message of judgment, Micah also conveyed messages of hope and restoration. He prophesied about the future regathering of the, re the remnant and the establishment of God's peaceful and righteous uh, kingdom. So there's messianic uh, prophecy in uh, Micah. Messianic prophecy is whenever the prophecy is related to the coming of the Messiah and what the Messiah will bring. That's messianic prophecy. So we find messianic messages uh, to the Southern Kingdom. Notice there are no messia messianic messages to the Northern Kingdom. Messianic messages are to the Southern Kingdom because the Messiah would come from, uh, from there. Uh, also a call to uh, repentance, 
similar to his message to Israel. Micah called for the repentance in Judah. He urged the people to turn away from idolatry and false prophets and dishonest practices and to embrace justice and mercy. Uh, Micah 6 verse 9. There's some universal themes, if you wish, uh, in, in the book of uh, Micah. Uh, a couple of those I want to uh, uh, draw your attention to. The first one is the universal message of justice. He speaks about justice. Micah's message transcended national boundaries. He spoke universally about the importance of justice and mercy and humility before God, emphasizing that these principles apply to all the nations, not, not just to the Northern Kingdom and to the Southern Kingdom. His prophecy said, justice and mercy uh, are things that all nations uh, should be practicing. Uh, Micah chapter four, verses one to four, and chapter six, verse eight. And the other one is the hope for the future. Micah's prophecies included a glimpse of a hope, hopeful future, envisioning a time when God's kingdom would be established and justice and righteousness would uh, prevail. Note that Micah doesn't organize his material with all the prophecies concerning the North you know, in one chapter, and then all the material about the Southern Kingdom in another chapter. That's why it's sometimes difficult to read his book and to keep figuring out who is he uh, talking to. He kind of spreads his topics out, referring to North and South in different parts of uh, his book. Uh, so he might be talking about injustice and he's talking about injustice for the North and the South uh, and, and, and hope for the future. Oh, well, that's just the South. So uh, you have to read his book, uh, looking at the various themes uh, that he's uh, talking about uh, and not, uh, you know, not try to figure out which part of the book is he talking about the North and which part is he talking about the South. He talks about the North and the South continually you know, throughout the book. Uh, there are two well-known passages uh, that are out of the book of uh, Micah. Uh, the first is Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is a passage quoted uh, over and over again. Jesus himself refers to this passage while admonishing the Pharisees for their spiritual blindness and their legalism. And then in Micah chapter five, verse two, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, his goings forth uh, from long ago, from the days of eternity. And of course here, the famous prophecy concerning the Messiah's birthplace, quoted by priests to King Herod when he inquired about the Messiah's place of birth, when the, uh, when the wise men uh, came through Jerusalem and they stopped and the king questioned, why are you here? And uh, there was a star and you know, uh, the, a king is born and he, he wanted to know uh, uh, where, where, where was the Messiah supposed to be born? And he called in the priests to ask them, what place of birth do the scriptures say the Messiah will be born in? And they, they give him Micah chapter five, verse two, uh, the definitive Old Testament passage uh, that names the place uh, where the Messiah will be born. Um, an outline of um, uh, Micah's book, it's got seven sections. Section one, the introduction, identifies Micah as the prophet, sets the context of his prophecies. Also, he describes the coming judgment on both the Northern and the Southern kingdoms at the very beginning. Then he talks about the judgment against Israel, the North, in chapter one, five to 16. He pronounces judgment on Samaria. He uses word plays and puns to emphasize the destruction that will be on that uh, nation. Part three, woes against corrupt leaders. Uh, Micah chapter two, verses one to 13. He condemns the leaders, the wealthy elite for their social injustice, their oppression of the poor. He pronounces woes against those 
who plan evil and who covet fields and homes and of course all the machinations that took place in order to take over the fields and the property of the, uh, of the poor uh, by the rich. Uh, talks about the future kingdom. You'd think he'd talk about that at the very end, but no, right in the middle, he talks about the future kingdom. Uh, chapters three and four, denounces the corrupt leaders and the false prophets and judges, and he promises a future restoration and the establishment of God's kingdom where justice and peace will prevail. Talks about the birthplace of the Messiah that we've just mentioned, chapter five, verses one to six. Uh, and then uh, uh, section number six in his book, God's case against Israel, uh, chapter six, verses one to 16. He kind of presents a courtroom like setting where God brings a case against his people and he emphasizes the importance of justice and mercy and humility rather than ritual sacrifices. They were, they were going to the temple and they were going through the motions correctly. You know, they were offering the animal, they were doing all the steps that they had to do to make proper sacrifices. Uh, but God in judging them tells them, yes, you're doing this, but your heart is far away from me. They were doing this, but they were also at the same time uh, uh, um, practicing all kinds of social uh, injustice, uh, corruption, and also uh, privately uh, worshiping, worshiping idols. And then at the end, hope amidst judgment, uh, chapter seven, Micah laments the moral and social decay in society. He expresses hope in God's mercy and also ends with a prayer for God's intervention and salvation. So the book of Micah, it's a mix. It's a mix of judgment and hope. It addresses both the sins of the people and the promise of a future redemption it highlights the importance of justice and mercy and humility in the context of a covenant relationship with God. You can't have a covenant relationship with God without there being uh, mercy and justice in your uh, human uh, interactions with other people. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, a couple of lessons uh, for today. Uh, we usually uh, do this with the, the book, lesson number one. True believers practice true worship. True believers practice true worship. Micah challenged the idea that ritualistic practices alone were enough to fulfill God's requirements. Instead, he emphasized the importance of genuine and humble relationships with God. Believers are encouraged to prioritize a sincere heart for God, seeking Him in humility and repentance and obedience rather than relying solely on external religious observances. True worship has both components. Uh, yes, you get, the, you get the, um, the worship order correctly because God has given it to us both in the Old and New Testament. Yes, that is important, but also you have a right relationship with God in humility and repentance. You're seeking after God on a daily basis. You have to have both of these things. They're complementary to each other. Having just one is, is, is not enough. Second lesson, and I'm not saying these are all the lessons that are there. These are the ones that I've found. Our worship practices are witnessed by our commitment to justice and mercy. And when I say witnessed, I mean witnessed by other people. Micah emphasizes the importance of justice, mercy, and ethical conduct. Believers today are reminded of their responsibility to act justly, to show mercy, and to uphold righteousness in their interactions with other people. In this way, our spiritual exercises, you know, like prayer and praise and communion, these are made acceptable to God as seen and as, seen as legitimate by non-believers. A non-believer who sees the way you act in a just and righteous and loving manner on the outside of the building will, uh, will um, credit uh, your worship practice as legitimate. In other words, you won't be called, we won't be called hypocrites. People call us hypocrites because in church we act one way and out in the world we act a different way. And it's the old story. This is what Micah is calling out here. It doesn't matter if you're 
your rituals are, are beautiful and uh, you have a cappella singing that sounds wonderful and you have dynamic preaching and all this and that. It doesn't matter if it has no effect on your character when you go out into the world. Well, that's true today, uh, just as it was true, uh, you know, 3000 years ago, uh, you know, in, in the time of these uh, prophets. And then one more, as believers, we have a true hope for salvation. Despite the message of judgment and the consequences of disobedience, Micah also presented a message of hope and future restoration. Believers today can draw encouragement from the assurance that God is a God of redemption. No matter how dire the circumstances, there's always hope for renewal and forgiveness and, and a future for those who continually return to him for forgiveness and for restoration. Micah's book, encourages believers to persevere in faith, trusting that God's ultimate plan is to save us and to keep us with him forever in heaven. That's what he wants and what he'll accomplish for us. We should, we should trust that he'll succeed. It, just one last thing here. So many people, so many people think that what God really wants is to punish us. It, it, so many people see uh, salvation. Uh, salvation is I'm hanging on to a cliff, you know, I'm hanging on to a bar, you know, uh, with my fingertips, you know, and God is above going bang, you know, trying to get my hands off of, you know, we, we think that God somehow is going to be happy if we don't make it. And uh, the opposite is what is true. What, what God really wants is to save us and bless us. And we have to allow him to do that to, for us. It's not that he wants us to fail, he wants us to succeed. He puts everything in our, in our life for us to succeed at remaining, at remaining faithful. Uh, so we need to have that, you know, that mindset, that confidence, God wants us to be in heaven with him. He wants that. And he works at that each day uh, through his Holy Spirit, uh, through his word, through his church uh, and other uh, various ways. Okay, so there's uh, um, more information on Micah. Our assignment, if you have the time, if you're willing, like I say, so reread Obadiah and Micah. Hopefully it'll come alive uh, for you. And uh, the book of Jonah, if you've never read it, it's a great read, familiar story, but we'll see if we can draw some interesting, uh, interesting material from there. That's it for today. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance.